Patrick Gasserli, Junior Chair, Professor of Business Administration at Harvard uh, Business School, and will speak on the subject of measuring and managing customer profitability in banking. So over to you, Dr. Uh, Maranen. Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, uh, inviting me, and uh, thank you to CBFS and uh, ICA Muscat. Uh, I'm also a chartered accountant from India. I finished in uh, 1987 November, so uh, happy to be uh, talking as a member of the institute as well. Um, so today, uh, you know, it's it's been a la last 20 months have been really hard for all of us because of COVID. But I think uh, we have to count our blessings, and uh, today is one of those. Uh, I'm sitting here in New York, talking to you uh, in Muscat, and people uh, maybe joining from other places as well. Uh, this technology was there even two years ago, but I wasn't getting this many invitations. And uh, in terms of physical travel, you could maybe accept like once a month, but uh, this has been one of the silver linings, I would say, that you can connect with so many people from around the world uh, without sort of uh, leaving your time zone. So uh, so those are the small blessings. Uh, let me get uh, make this presentation and uh, I'd like this to be as interactive as possible. Um, so if you have uh, any questions, if you want to uh, speak up, speak. It's small enough that we don't have to be uh, very formal. Um, and uh, I will share some slides with you, but I'm hoping that uh, we'll have uh, a lot of time for uh, Q&A. Um, I'll draw on my experience. I've been on the board of a bank, a uh, very small bank on the board for about, uh, I would say, 12 years. And uh, in those 12 years, we have gone from a balance sheet size of $300 million to about $3 billion. So it's been a tremendous period of growth for us. and. Uh, I also draw from my experience teaching uh, about customer measurement uh, related, related to customer profitability and customer satisfaction. I'm sort of putting the two together because they are uh, the journeys of this bank, but all in from a practical sense, but also what I teach from a theoretical perspective are quite related. So let me see, this is the moment of truth. Hopefully I can share my slides. Okay, so, um, Hopefully you can see my slides. So let's start with what is strategy? And I think that's a very important uh, question to start with. Uh, the first one is strategy is answering two basic questions. One is what is the value proposition to my target customer? What is it that I provide to them that's a value? Uh, and the key word here is the target segment because uh, you can be providing value to many of your customers, but you really need to focus your activities. You need to put together, string together your activities so that you maximize value to your target segment. The second piece of this, and you need to be able to articulate this, and that's your strategy statement. What is the value proposition to my target customer? And the second question is, how am I different from uh, competition for my target customer. So from the eyes of the views of my target customer, how do they perceive me to be different from my competitors? And that's your competitive positioning. And uh, you need to answer, you know, at a, at a very basic level, this is like strategy 101 kind of thing, these two questions. Now, different banks follow different strategies, even within the space of banks. I, I'll just focus on retail banking because all of us have uh, interacted with retail banks, if not as on the uh, uh, bank side, as certainly as customers. Um, here are a few generic strategies. One might be to say, let me delight the customer with service. Another one might be, oh, come to me if you want uh, the full range of products. Uh, you want to send money to this country, you want me to uh, take care of your uh, uh, insurance needs that go with banking. It's all like one one stop shop. Uh, third way with, to compete might be the lowest cost and the best rates. I have the uh, you know best rates, not only on my loan products, but also on my deposit products. 
and uh, an enabler of those lowest costs is that I have uh, the, the best rates is that I have low costs. Uh, another one might be I occupy a niche. I'm sitting here in New York and uh, you know I drive by State Bank of India and say, well, that's a niche. They take care of their customers who are from India, who have a lot of uh, repatriation needs, etc. That's the niche that they want to, the familiar face they want to provide. So that's sort of how they're competing here. Compete on convenience. Uh, you have an uh, ATM in every street corner, and if you need something done, the bank will come to your house. Uh, you can compete on technology, you know, so you have the latest apps, you have the best uh, websites, and uh, you're so uh, adopting of the best and the latest technology that you attract certain customers who are also looking for that. Uh, you compete on speed, you compete on your network. So these are all very generic strategies and you got to pick one and go back uh, for your chosen strategy. What is the value proposition to my target customer and how am I different from my competitors? So once you know what your uh, strategy is, how you're going to add value to your customer and how you're going to differentiate yourself, you, you need to organize yourself to deliver on that strategy. So in uh, we say structure always follows strategy. So once you know strategy, you put together the structure. Um, you have the set of activities you need to excel at to come from your strategy. So if you're going to be uh, delighting the customer with your high levels of service, then your activities should all be put together uh, to delight that customer. You don't want a, a structure where, for instance, you're organized by product lines and uh, you, your strategy is to delight the customer because uh, the, the customer comes to you and says, you know, I have a check me savings account with you. I was wondering whether I, ha I can get a, a mortgage, whether I can get a retirement product from you. And you're like, oh, that's a different branch. Let me send you over to my friend who is sitting in that desk. Uh, you kind of lose the customer. So your organization structure also needs to change so that you are aligned with your strategy. And the activities that you need to excel at, you don't need to excel at cutting costs. Uh, that would help. But for a strategy of delighting the customer service, all your activities that need to excel at are also focused on serve, de delivering service. From that, you say, OK, this is my strategy. These are the activities I need to be good at. Uh, how do I get my employees to deliver on that to, for my customers? So how will you motivate your employees? Uh, this also comes from your strategy, right? So if it's customer service, uh, you recruit a different set of people. Um, there's a famous case of this bank called, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Co-op Bank here uh, in Boston, where they say they only recruit people uh, who interact with customers who are always smiling in, in, in a normal state, the normal state, their face is always smiling. That's the person they want to have for customer service. They're very, very picky about who they pick. And it's not about the technical qualifications, but it's like, generally, are you happy to be around people? That uh, turns out to be extremely important to them. The last piece of this is what you measure. So we said structure follows strategy, systems follow structure. So your performance evaluation system, your compensation system, all those systems need to follow, you know, what your strategy and your structure say, and therefore what you measure comes from your strategy. So if you're going to be focused on customers, um, uh, customer segments, then you start measuring customer profitability. If you're going to be organized by products, then product profitability is just fine. What happens is that most banks are historically organized by products, and they're making a transition to customer segments, <coughs> but the systems are still product focused. So many banks can tell you how much money they're making on their as a whole across all accounts on the checking accounts, savings accounts, and uh, they can tell you how much money they're making on the credit card products, on the retirement products, on their loan products, but they can't tell you, hey, here's a customer VG across all those products, what is the value of that? How much uh, profitability are you making on that customer? Uh, many banks even today are not able to uh, generate that kind of information. And that turns out is very important because that's how you measure success and you need to be linking your incentives to those measures of success. 
this gets particularly interesting when some banks, uh, you, you come to Boston, you come to Cambridge, and you'll see the Harvard Square, all these banks giving away uh, toaster ovens, they're giving away water bottles to all these Harvard undergrads. Now, those students don't keep a big balance, okay? So the, the banks are losing money on those accounts, but the hope is once in a while they'll bounce a check and they'll hit them with the fees. Uh, but other than that, it's not like a lot of activity going on, on with students. But the reason they get them as students is that they know that once you know you open a bank account, odds are even when you get a job, you'll stick with the same bank. So they know the stickiness is there. People don't change. People change like banking, uh, like four or five key moments in life when they go to college, uh, when they get a job, when they move to a new city, when they have kids, uh, when they retire, when they, you know, they say they buy a house. Okay, so those are like five or six life events. And uh, as long as you don't mess up, people are not going to keep switching in between. So they might shop for rates the first time around, but after a while, if you're within the ballpark, they're not going to jump to someone else when they're looking for a relationship. Now, if they're buying a house, they're going to shop around for rates. OK, so there are going to be key moments when they're doing it, but on an ongoing basis for uh, how much minimum do I have to keep in my checking account, savings accounts. Once you have all your bill pay set up, it's it's the switching costs involved. So uh, you, you need to understand if your strategy is get them as young when they're lost and you're initially agreeing to have them as loss leaders. OK, when they are maybe from 18 to 25, and then you'll turn them profitable. Now, if you're not measuring profitability of the customer and through their age, depending on which segment, whether they're students, versus when they're working, etc. If you're not tracking that, you don't even know if your stra strategy of being a, having a loss leader strategy is working. So you're kind of executing all of this on faith. We don't need to do that. We now have the ability to measure each of these things. So the, the uh, accountants, the chartered accountants need to become strategy experts and the strategy uh, people also need to understand uh, what uh, is feasible technology wise so that people can come together. So your role in the organization is no longer just that of a CFO or a working the accounting office. You are the one helping execute the strategy. OK, so here's sort of like a way to think about this. So we start with on the left hand side coming from the strategy. How do I put together all the various activities that will differentiate me from competition, but also deliver the value proposition to the customer? So we do that. From the value proposition, we know what the willingness to pay of the customer is. How much can I charge? But you may, the customer may be willing to pay you more if you are the only one providing that service, but your competitor might also be, may not be just as good as you, maybe a little bit worse, but that defines the price, okay? The premium that you can extract relative to uh, your competitor's price, it depends on the value proposition to the customer relative to your competitor, okay? So that determines your price, Likewise, how you put together your various activities, you know, what do you outsource, what do you keep inside, that affects your cost. Together, your price uh, and your cost affect your profits, but there are also things like attrition or the stickiness of the customer that come from the competitive positioning and the willingness to pay that affect the lifetime value of the customer. So you need a system that's measuring on a you know, periodic basis, every month, every quarter, etc. Profitability of all your customers, but also looking at this over time to see what is the lifetime value of that customer. And that lifetime value changes if you're able to cross sell more products because uh, it hopefully increases the value proposition of the bank to your customers, but also it changes the attrition. It's harder to switch if you have you know, Bank of America is if I go into log into my account, uh, it's got so many tentacles into my life that it's not that easy for me to just switch. You know, everything goes to them, right? So once they are become good at cross-selling, you got the customer for life. 
Okay, so historically, banks have been organized by products, not by customers. So the systems are set up to measure profitability by products, checking accounts, savings accounts, credit cards, loans, the time it's mortgages, etc. Et and bankers hire, train, and retain specialists by products. So the knowledge is all about product specialists. So and so is a specialist in retirement products. So and so is a specialist in mortgage products. Yet the brand of the company is the same. The brand of the bank is the same. The customer experiences all these products as being provided by the same provider. So what ends up happening is, in fact, if you're stepping away from it as an outsider looking at this, is extremely ironic. Uh, I wish to have several instances where I would go to a bank and say, hey, can you refer someone uh, in your bank who is you know, who can sell me, let's say I know them because of their uh, retirement products. And I tell them, like, can you refer to your mortgage division? And they'll say, you know, you can go to my branch or you can go to any of our competitors. They are more willing to promote their competitors than their own bank. You know, this is all done in a very subtle way. They want to be very open about it, right? And you're like, why is that? Now, they're worried that if their sister division screws up, you as a customer will be upset with the brand, with the bank, and their relationship with you is affected. So the best divisions for which a bank is known, the best products for which a bank is known, is usually very reluctant to recommend the other products within the same umbrella to the customers because only bad things can happen to this division, this product. Okay, when you refer someone else to your own uh, brand and they don't have the same level of service that you, know that you can provide or you are afraid that your sister division which is a new startup cannot provide you're not that eager to cross sell whereas all these banks think like oh we are very good at this let me add this other product and we'll start cross selling to existing customers they don't realize they're not aligned the each product person has their loyalty first to their product not to the brand till you change the structure till you change the measurement systems this cross-selling will remain a pipe dream and so many banks stumble when they're trying to do this cost study. Now, what has also changed is that customer acquisition costs have soared, right? And uh, even if you are using mostly digital platforms to acquire your customers, the costs are pretty high. And uh, once you get the customer, you want to lock in by cross-selling but if you're organized by products and your own employees are not that eager to engage in cross-selling, you, you, you don't have a viable strategy. If you don't you know, deliver on the uh, uh, organization structure and the measurement systems piece. Okay, so what do banks need to measure? Hundreds of things, but I'm just focusing on one small piece of this to deliver on your strategy, what do you need to measure? You absolutely need to have a good handle on your customer acquisition costs, and that's going to vary by channel, vary by segment. Uh, you need to be able to do track all your cross-selling, particularly for banks that have grown by acquisition. So you used to be good at this, you want to go into a new territory, new product, so you acquire someone who's a leading provider in that. Uh, you want to, I know a lot of retail banks that go acquire an insurance broker as a subsidiary. Why? Because through the insurance broker, they want to be able to offer insurance services to their mortgage clients, their automotive loan clients. But likewise, for the insurance brokerage clients, they want to offer more loan products, more auto loan, more mortgage loans, etc. Seems good in theory, but uh, for the reasons I just talked about, if if you don't even have this customer name mapping, you keep calling them and they're like, I already have your mortgage. You didn't even know that? Well, you didn't know that because you just acquired a, a insurance broking agency and uh, your customer lists are not cross-linked. Your customer IDs are not cross-linked. Uh, so even tracking cross-selling is, is, you know, you need to start thinking about before you do the acquisition. The third one is customer satisfaction of the target segment. I know a lot of banks that measure customer satisfaction but they can't tell you what the satisfaction of the target segment is, okay? So if you're trying to keep the high net worth individuals happy, but if you're measuring customer satisfaction across the board, that will not work. Because if you're trying to keep the high net worth individuals happy, 
part of that is keeping the low net worth individuals unhappy. OK, that, you know, this might shock many of you to hear it, but if you really focus on your strategy, it means that you will not bend backwards. You'll not try to be all things to all people. You'll try to say, this is my strategy. Here's who I need to keep happy. OK, um, so there are going to be some people that are very price conscious and you're focusing on high net worth individuals and focus on high levels of service. Uh, yes, if you can provide high levels of service at a very low cost, everyone's happy, but that's not possible. High levels of service is costly to, therefore your prices will not be the most competitive. So if you go ask a low net worth individual who's looking for, let's say, uh, the lowest prices, how satisfied are you with the bank? They're going to be like, oh, I'm very unhappy. They're unhappy about the prices, but that wasn't your strategy. So you need to focus on customer satisfaction of the target segment. You need to be able to track customer attrition and again by target segment. Uh, how long are we retaining them? Why are they leaving? Uh, is it, are they leaving for reasons related to our strategy or are they leaving because of, you know, they just uh, moved to a different uh, geographic location that I don't have presence? We need to have customer profitability for each account. So you get take the loss leader the checking and savings account, you add the profits coming from the retirement products and the loan products, and you'd say overall, is this account profitable? But also sometimes some customers will come and ask for something extra special. Now, the same request from a very profitable account will say, yeah, sure, no problem, I'll take care of you. I'll, I'll handle that, we can. But uh, another customer who's already a loss making customer comes to you with a special request, you're going to be like, no, sorry, we can't provide that. Now, the answer is different depending on how profitable the account is, but till you know that when you put together different products in one place, you don't know whether to provide this level of service to the customer or not. Or, you know, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit later about Royal Bank of Canada, which goes by RBC. Even 20 years ago, uh, you call them in customer service, they know your profitability and lifetime value. So who picks up the phone? Depends on your profitability and lifetime value. So for instance, uh, you know, I call a uh, professor, low lifetime value customer. So they'll put someone who they recruited last week to answer my call. So I don't get high levels of service and they won't even probably pick up my call for little, it rings 10 times. One of my student calls, oh, MBA, Harvard, oh, high lifetime value of the customer. They pick up on the first ring and they give a very experienced person to service those calls. Just from the caller ID, and they've been doing this for 20 years. They know who's calling and what level of service to provide because and that's all linked to your profit and to what segment you're from. OK, they also track current profits versus the full profit potential because they know if you have certain educational background, you're a good candidate for these products. So they might lose money on you today, but they're constantly tracking to say what is the full profit potential for this customer because if I sell all these products for whom they're a good target, this is how much my profit will change. And also they track the lifetime value of the customer to look at, and that folds in attrition, stickiness, all of that, and compare it to the customer acquisition cost. So there's a lot of need for measurement just in this space. Um, what does it take to, you know, how easy is this? What, what, what do I need to do that? Um, so you need to be able to capture all the activities and transactions of a customer with the bank in one place. Even if those transactions happen across different channels and departments, one day the customer is showing up at the ATM, another day they're showing up in branch and person, the third day they're showing up in a different city, a fourth day they're interacting on, uh, on, the, on the internet. It all, you know, you uh, track it back to the same customer across all products. And you need an accounting system that will tell you the cost of each of these activities. Someone goes to the ATM machine, makes a deposit or a withdrawal. How much does it cost you per transaction? If they come and do that with a teller, how much does it cost you? If they do it online, if they do it on the phone, each one you need to know what is the cost of those transactions and activities. You also need to know this for money, right? So the customer might have some loan products. The customer might have some deposit products. You're making money on the loan products. You're making money on the deposit products. So you need a central treasury that pays interest on the deposits to your own bank for the deposits of, to the branches that are generating those deposits. And you also need the central treasury that is charging for the loans when the loans are being deployed uh, 
for another branch that might be making the loan. So you might be uh, taking in deposits from rural locations and making loans in urban locations. Both the branches need to be able to measure the profits. So you need a risk adjusted central treasury that adjusts both for risk and for the tenure of the loan. Right. So these are all like very basic things that you need to have in place before you can start measuring customer profit. But once you set it up such that the transactions, the activities, the funds, you have the cost and revenue for this, you can slice and dice it many different ways. You can keep your old product focus and measure it by product lines. Uh, you can do it by customer and you can do it through channels or customer segments. You can do it by locations. What is my branch profitability? What is my country profitability? So once you have the basic building blocks, you are able to slice and dice us differently to measure your profits every which way. OK, um, so let me talk a little bit about RBC. Uh, they used to be called Royal Bank of Canada. They go by all these financial institutions now that have gone to acronyms. Um, so RBC strategy was like all things to all people, right? For instance, you can get checking accounts, savings accounts, CDs, mutual funds, investment advice, insurance, retirement savings, home mortgage, car, loan, car loans, credit cards, all of this. And uh, they were finding it difficult to compete with low cost providers who had niche strategies. And those niche would be they take one product and they would get very good at it and they'd be the cheapest. So if you're looking for home mortgages, you go online and you choose ING might have the lowest home mortgage or they might have the uh, best rates on deposit products. Why they didn't have the branch network? They were doing it all centrally processing it all online banking only and they were not incurring the real estate cost um, of carrying all these branches. So very difficult for RBC to compete with ING. But the way they compete is to become go from all things to all people to one stop shop. So you you can trust your banker uh, and uh, that is the emotion that they're trying to go for. OK, so the organizational structure, they moved from product line to matrix of products and customer segments when the customer relationship management system was introduced and uh, the segmentation of customers is by life stages. OK, and they set up this strategic ma marketing research and analytics group in Toronto that does market research and data mining. Okay. So. The only way you compete with niche players is to leverage the wealth of information that you can collect across the products. For instance, you have superior information on credit risk. If you also sell savings and retirement products to their customers. OK, so you compete on information. And the tension between product and customer focus for strategy organization structure and profitability computation. We've been talking about this. And so there is this. If you're using certain products as loss leaders, how do you know they're doing a good job? If they lost more money, did they do a better job? So you, you don't know how to evaluate the performance when your strategy doesn't line up by products and it's actually cutting across products. And uh, so you have to change your strategy, your structure and your measurement systems at the same time. And that's what they did. So they found that banks were good at convenient hours, ATM access, short lines, a toll free number, Internet access. But what the customers were looking for is understanding mutual benefit, reciprocity, trust, reassurance. So the banks are good at the hard stuff and the customers were looking for the soft stuff. So they're like, OK, how do we do this? And they also knew some products are loss leaders and the customer profitability grows as the customer becomes older and saves and borrows more. But this is all hypothesis. They didn't know this for sure and they didn't know by how much. So they started, they, they understood the need for uh, lifetime measuring customer lifetime value. OK, so they were excellent. I mean, when they put together like kind of system I talked about, they became very good at measuring customer profitability and fairly unique in measuring customer potential because even at that time, other banks were measuring customer profitability, but not many of them were measuring profit potential. And they, they combined the two in very beautiful ways. For instance, to customize marketing campaigns. Um, you know, the you go to McDonald's and you, you buy a burger and your way out, they're asking you, do you want fries with that, right? They know. 
why does the customer, the customer, person selling a burger to you ask, do you want fries with it? They, they know that uh, historically people who got burgers have also bought fries. So if you probably you forgot, so it might be a good idea to ask this person. Now, that's that's the uh, value of information in uh, banking, right? So you know from the profile who is a good candidate. And uh, so you can customize your marketing campaign that uh, if you know someone has got uh, kids that were born, uh, your child that was born three months ago or six months ago, you're saying like, do you want to start saving for college? Uh, so you, you can ask those questions or if someone has got a new job and they got married, uh, then you say, do you want to start thinking about uh, a mortgage for your house? So you can go in early. Uh, you, and you can run customized marketing campaigns. I told you who picks up the phone uh, is dependent on your profitability and potential. So the level of service that's provided, they make it dependent on the profit and the profit potential. Uh, then there is the product design and pricing. Uh, you know, I told you about customization. Uh, a very wealthy individual comes in and says, uh, I need you to make a loan to my niece. You, know, you look at the niece, very poor credit history, doesn't have any income, but that niece wants to buy a car. Uh, the traditional answer is no, but your system says, oh, but this person has got a very wealthy aunt. So let's use this as a way to uh, keep the aunt happy and also sell to the niece. So you ask the aunt, will you co-sign? And if you're willing to co-sign for the loan, I'm happy to make the loan and I'll give you the same rate I would have given you. Right, you're making the niece happy and you're making the aunt happy, but that will work only if your system knows that uh, so and so has got a wealthy aunt, or you can recognize that. So, you, you, how you price a product, how you design the product, all of that. Uh, so, if you know that some product, for instance, is very sticky, that it's very hard for people to change uh, once they have that product with you, like for instance, bill pay. It's a very sticky feature. Once you set up an account where you put the names of all the people you're going to pay to, it's almost impossible for you to go start this. You know, I, I'm sending, uh, getting invoices from maybe 200 vendors, and uh, I can't, I mean, it's not that easy for me to sit and retype the information of all these 200 different vendors. So I'm kind of stuck with my bank. So for that would be a good product to give away for free, even if it's costing you money. Uh, or even subsidize it because that changes the stickiness of the customer. So the customer profitability and potential calculations <coughs> we talked about is when you have a loss leader strategy, you know, you, you need that for the to see if you are having the profit followers that together with the loss leader make the customer profitable, right? I wish they hadn't called this a loss leader strategy. I wish they called it the profit follower strategy because more important than losing money is having the products where you can follow up and cross sell and make it uh, profits. And so you need to be able to measure customer profitability, see the effectiveness of the loss leader strategy. Okay, and uh, the vast majority of the firms that I know do not and cannot track lifetime value of their customers. and. Uh, the decision on loss leaders, razor blade pricing, cross selling potential, acquisition costs, these are all made on faith, not facts. So the more cross selling, increased customer acquisition costs, higher churn rates and attrition, the more ability to, uh, but also more ability to lock in customers. That's the reason there's a demand for lifetime value calculations. Simultaneously, the cost of these computation has decreased, CRM and data mining technologies have improved, customers are not anonymous to us anymore. So the supply of lifetime value is going up and the demand for lifetime value, uh, you know, the cost is coming down, so supply is more, the demand is more, so more and more banks are adopting this. And it's not just banking, insurance companies, pretty much every financial service companies, even telecom companies, all service companies are tracking lifetime value of their customers because customer acquisition cost is, has to be matched against lifetime value. So this worked very well for Royal Bank, like, you know, billions of dollars. In the, as soon as they introduced the first three years, they were able to refer more cross-selling, 
and also new sales that were generated from those cross-referred customers. Okay, so over time, the new sales on the cross-referred customer went up dramatically. Uh, they had they segmented the customers into A, A, B, and C. A is the most profitable segment. So because of this cross-selling uh, and the implementation of this lifetime value, the number of uh, ACAR clients kept going up. Now this is a bank with like 23 million customers, so 122,000 a year is this is not bad, but it's not super uh, good either. But they're all moving into A, so they're transitioning from uh, like B and C into A, and the average profitability of the A clients was increasing each of those years. First year they added $43 in average profits, and then the following year another $10, another $16. So it's all cumulative. So you can keep your target segment happy. You can convert others into your A clients and you can increase the average profitability of your A clients. OK, and 60 percent reduction in the time required to get the direct marketing out the door, uh, increase the number of A clients by 15 percent and the efficiency of the direct marketing continue to improve uh, 65 percent versus target of 83 percent. OK, and the revenue growth even compared to the peers, you know, was they were growing much faster uh, than their competitors as soon as they put in this. Okay. So customer profitability, you can also, it doesn't have to be just customer focus, right? You can use that information to make process improvements. How do I use information technology to lower order processing costs? How do I uh, use information technology to lower the cost of customization? Uh, you can use activity based pricing. So should I price each service separately in B2B? That's what you would do. You would, uh, you know, if you have a business client, you would say I'm going to charge you per line item. And then when you go to B2C, you start forming bundles and you say you're the gold level, you're the silver level, you're the uh, sapphire level, whatever levels of service. Again, you can use it in pricing that way. OK. Um, so uh, you can manage the relationship. You can convert unprofitable customers to profitable customers by working with them. You can work some, you know, B clients to A clients. Uh, you can increase segment profits. You understand that not all segments, not all customers need to be profitable. You know, uh, there is this uh, bank that I worked with. They had like a four year program. They used to call them freshman, sophomore, junior and senior. It's only in the fourth year that the customers became profitable, but they had a plan. So for every customer, they'll be like, if you're not transitioning from the first year to second year and you've not bought more products, then you're not on track to becoming uh, a very profitable customer. It might take me four years, but I need to have a plan and I need to be monitoring whether the customers are following the plan. OK, so not every customer is profitable today, but over their lifetime they will be. Likewise, not all segments need to be profitable. Maybe there are some marquee segments where um, they're, they're referral, they provide you other clients, so you, you track that segment separately. Or, uh, uh, you know, over that lifetime, they'll become more profitable. So you have a reason to keep them, and you're also measuring how much I'm losing on them, and you're okay with that, right? But you should also uh, monitor the profitability or lack thereof. And uh, you'll be surprised. Uh, for most banks, a majority of their customers lose money. It is a few customers at the top end that sub end up subsidizing the rest of the customers. And therefore, I'm not saying like go drop all your unprofitable customers because your unprofitable customers are still making a contribution towards the overhead cost. So I get that. But this tells you who you should add and how to work at the ones that are at the margin so that you can convert them into profitable customers and who to lose because the ones that are actually consuming more or most of your resources, you know, these are the customers that will show up at your branch, you know, delay your teller, uh, all sorts of requests, and they're not even your target segment. Okay, so those are the customers where if you can gently send them away, they make an excellent gift to your competition. OK, so and lastly, we talked about like marketing campaigns, how to target the acquisition of customers. OK, 
A lot of implementation challenges. Uh, many banks wait for their competition to move first. Uh, sometimes you need to educate your competition. When you start charging for certain services that are killing you, the customer, your competitor is also waiting for someone to move first. And they're like, oh, thank God you did it. And then everyone else quickly follows. So sometimes it's your job to educate your competition and you do it through your pricing. Um, you lose the customers, but keep the cost. This is the thing that I want about where the first reaction is when you find that 60% of your customers or 40% of your customers lose money is to get rid of those customers. And you can't do that because they're subsidizing, they're making contribution towards your overhead cost. But within that, the left tail, the bottom 5% is where you might see some action in who you're willing to lose. And the top 5% is where you're willing to say, how do I keep these customers? How do I increase the level of service to those customers? How do I cross sell more to those customers? They're your precious customers. So all the action is in the two tails, the middle 80, 90%, you don't do much about it, okay? Uh, you continue to link incentives to revenues. I still know a lot of banks where how much business you bring in is what pays the incentive. They don't link the incentives to the profitability of the customer, which would be a problem. So you might have new numbers. You might start measuring customer profitability, but you have the same old culture where you're focusing on your product profitability. And uh, that would be a big challenge. Lastly, you're maximizing profits at the expense of uh, customer satisfaction. That's a very short term thing. So you need to think about the lifetime value of the customer, right? OK, so let me. Uh, stop there. Um, OK, so let me stop there and 